Edward Theodore Gein was born August 27, 1906 in Wisconsin. So last week, Mean Mean Ed Gein would have celebrated his 110th birthday. He was the second of only two children. His brother was Henry, who was five years his senior, and his parents' names were George and Augusta Gein. Ed's father, George, had a sad life. George grew up in the late 1800s in a nice family of four with mom, dad, and a sister. They weren't poor, but they were only about a buck or two away from being poor. One day in the 1880s, George's sister and his parents went to the market, and I guess they had to like cross a river to do so. And when they tried to cross the river, all three of them were swept away. So at a young age, George Gein was an orphan, and he grew up pretty much sad and alone. When George was in his mid-20s, he married Augusta, who was about three years younger than he was. Mm-hmm. They were married in December of 19, I'm sorry, 1899. Ed Gein's older brother, Henry, was born in 1902. And as said, Ed followed and was born in 1906. Henry and Ed were born in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And at some point during Ed's early school years, they would move to Plainfield, Wisconsin, when his parents purchased a 275-acre farm six miles outside of town. Yeah, and this is like a really small town. Yeah, La Crosse, Wisconsin back then was was pretty much a very small town, but, you know, that was all the sticks and everything. Right. However, Plainfield was even smaller than that. Yeah, very I mean, small. Roughly like 690 people. Yeah, and Henry and Ed had a pretty boring childhood. Their father was a drunk. Uh, he did okay. They did okay as farmers, but uh, they made a little bit of money. But the mm-hmm. father spent a lot of that money on his drinking habit. George uh, was not really available as a father to the boys. He worked on the farm and then he drank. Their father, George, he was constantly getting belittled by their mother, Augusta. She didn't treat her husband like a man. She treated him like a failure and constantly reminded him that he was a failure. Well, yeah, and he pretty much was a failure, but maybe that verbal abuse was made his failure even worse. Yeah, yeah, she was, she was pretty much verbally abusive to say the very least. It actually wouldn't surprise me if she were physically abusive to him as well, maybe at some point. Yeah, there's no reports of that, but you can speculate. Yeah, she ruled the roost. You know, their mother, Augusta, she was extremely religious, uh, very much the hell and fire brimstone mindset. Yeah, Um, and and the thing about her religious readings, which is interesting to me, is she had a fixation on revelations. She only taught her boys of the evils of drinking and that sex was a filthy act. Mm -hmm. Sex was something that should be reserved for marriage and for child making only. Yeah. But sometimes sex is a filthy act. So she talked badly about women and she actually referred to all women as whores. Mm. Well, this makes it difficult growing up and and difficult to figure out the world, right? Captain, I mean, you're Mm -hmm. taught by your mother that sex is only for child making inside of a marriage, but Good luck finding a wife when she's telling you all women are evil. You know, who are you supposed to hook up with? Yeah, and then that puts a weird thought into your head of if all women are evil and all women are whores, my mother is a woman, so what is she? And she's the one teaching you all of this as well. You know, it's it's very confusing to say the least. Yeah, but this is the early 1900s, right? Yeah. She was born in 06. 06. So, I mean, religious, you know, beliefs were... Definitely ruled the household, ruled the country more, more like it was more commonplace. Yes. Yeah. And then, you know, being raised Catholic, I mean, you kind of have some of this go into your psyche when you're young, Mm -hmm. but not to this extent. I mean, this is, this is borderline wacky behavior. Well, it's, it's also abusive. It's actually just not borderline. It's just straight up wacky behavior, right? She's verbally abusive to the husband and and now she's psychologically abusive to the the children and confusing them by telling them all women are evil. Based probably telling them everyone's evil, but you know, and to top that off, she did not encourage the boys to make friends in all likelihood. She probably persuaded them to not have any friends at all. I mean, she had these boys working all the time. They were always busy doing chores in the house or most of the time out working on the farm. Yeah. And Ed didn't even finish school. Yeah, I think he quit school at 14, and they said that the only time that he was allowed to leave the house or allowed to not be working on the farm was Mm -hmm. to go to school. 
At school, Ed was a very average student. Later, his IQ was you tested. You don't say. Yeah. His IQ was tested later and it came out. What do you think? Average intelligence. Yeah, but do you know what the number was? I do not know the number. Because the, the average can change, and especially back in the early 20s, 30s, then the number would have been a little lower, I believe. And so I heard a, a term from my friend Corinne this week that said uh, he's probably one of the part of the Shady's 80s kids. The Shady's, that means you're in the 80s. Right. And right. you're Shady's. Right. And he's Shady and he's in the 80s. But so, I mean, it's surprising that he had, was of average intelligence, but really, I mean, he was on the low side of things well they just said average intelligence uh the only thing i guess he really seemed to excel in was reading i'm guessing this might be because reading may have been his only form of entertainment or maybe even some kind of escape yeah their house didn't have any electricity and i didn't i don't think it had running water no no it didn't have electricity no running water uh, we have an average kid here and he's basically Shady's described as kid. pretty average and maybe a little odd they said he had this weird quirk where he would laugh like kind of out of turn. <laughs> yeah, like he would he would laugh at nothing. Like there was a joke or something funny in his head, and instead of sharing that joke or Sorry. or the humor, right. he would simply enjoy that moment to himself. Ed would continue to live with his parents well into adulthood. There's and, nothing wrong with that. And keep in mind, this farm and the house, it, it, like you had said, it was no paradise. You know, the house didn't have electricity. And it didn't have modern plumbing. But they're on a lot of acres, you know, which is pretty cool. 275 acres. In fact, he was still living there when his father passed. Uh, This was in 1940. Ed's father, George, died of a heart attack. George was 66, and Ed would have been 34 at this time. So now it's just Augusta Gein and her two boys, Ed and Henry, living together on the farm. And if you want to know what the farm looked like, I put that on Instagram, but you can also see that on the website as well. Oh, cool. Well, uh, older brother Henry, he was not exactly like Ed. Ed pretty much worshipped his mother. He listened to her. He believed her. And he believed the things that she said and the things that she had taught him. Ed wanted to do right by his mom. And I think with how much she talked about evil and mistrust and how bad people are and how bad their habits are, Mm -hmm. I think Ed, you know, the only love and approval worth seeking to him was that of his mother. Mm -hmm. Well, she's so judgmental. She, she was. And, but like I said, Henry was different. Uh, I don't mean like different, like, you know, some people say that boy's a little different. Well, No. no, that's what they were saying about Ed. Yeah, exactly. He's worshiping the mom. And Henry is let, normal. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, he's normal and he wants a normal life. He desired a more normal life, a traditional adult life, mm-hmm. you know, things like not living his entire life with his parents or at his parents' home and maybe seeking the companionship of a woman. At this time, Ed and Henry both worked as handymen and they were doing odd jobs around town. Ed also frequently babysat for neighbors. You know, mm-hmm. if you need a good recommendation. <laughs> Yeah, if you need a babysitter on Friday night, call up Ed. So Henry, being the adult man that he is, he started doing normal things, and he began dating, and he actually got involved in a relationship with a divorced woman who was the mother of two children. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if their mother knew of this relationship, there was no way that she was approving of this. So you just think he lied about it the whole time? I don't know if if he lied or or if she was aware. I'm sure that there was all kinds of feuding going on in the Gein household. But that probably would not have got to Henry. Like I said, he didn't agree with all of Augusta's views and opinions of the world and its people. It's been rumored that Henry even spoke ill of his mother. And he did this, and he probably did this around his brother Ed and and communicated this to Ed. Right, which could have pissed Ed off. Yeah, and and well after this relationship developed with the divorced woman, Mm -hmm. Henry was planning on moving out and off of the Gein farm and move in with his girlfriend. Yeah, he wanted to move in with her, uh, probably because she had uh, electricity and running water. <laughs> yeah, she had some amenities. He's like, look, I can take it. I can take a crap and then listen to the radio at the same time. On May 16th, 1944, Henry and Ed were burning away marsh vegetation on the property, and the fire got out of control. Now, this drew the attention of the local fire department. By the end of the day, the fire having been extinguished and the firefighters gone, Ed reported his brother as missing. Now, this was well after dark, so they had to come out with lanterns and flashlights, and the search party searched for Henry, 
and they end up finding his dead body lying face down. Yeah, but there's two stories to this. I mean, because... I think there's probably six or seven stories right, to this, but, but go ahead with but, story two. Right. The other one is that Ed actually, when he went to the police and said, look, there's this fire, it got out of control, I can't find my brother, that Ed actually led them right to the body. Yeah, strangely enough. I don't know where he is, but, oh, here he is. <laughs> right, but he, he might be here. Oh, there he is. They seem to believe that, he, that Henry had been dead for some time, and it appeared that the cause of death was heart failure since he had not been burned or injured otherwise. The authorities accepted the accident theory, but there was no official investigation into his death, and there was no autopsy that was performed. The police dismissed the possibility of foul play, and the county coroner later officially listed asphyxiation as the cause of death. But there was also bruises on his head and his face, which they thought were odd. But they also thought, man, look, this family has been through a lot of stuff. The father died. You know, it's just a single mom now with two sons trying to uh, work on this farm. This is a large plot of land. Um, so they just felt like there was already enough tragedy with the family that they didn't want to go after Ed for this. Another stroke of bad luck. Now, it's just Ed Gein and his mother now, uh, but Augusta's health would start to go south after her son's death. Yeah, but you think that the, the torment and the torture, basically, that she is putting on him with her beliefs as she's getting older and probably deteriorating mental health-wise, that... This uh, psychological abuse is probably getting more so with Ed. Well, and but she's she is her health is deteriorating, you know, and she suffered a stroke. And Ed, as we would expect, spent all of his time taking care of his mother. And after a second stroke, her health deteriorated even rapidly, more rapidly after that, and she died in December of 1945. She was 67 at the time of her death, and Ed was 39. This is very bad, right? There's no way that this could go well. I mean, Ed is not only all alone now. He's without direction. His mother, who had taught him everything and told him how to live. But you could actually assume, you could actually think or hope that it could get better. Because maybe he would get involved in the society and they could correct some of the weird thoughts he was having. Possibly. Maybe it's too late, though. I mean, someone that he had pretty much devoted his Well, he is almost 40 now. Yeah, he, he devoted his entire life to, and, and especially his adult life. What was that word? Especially. All right. Just to let the listeners know, you're working on that word. Hey, I'll tell the stories here. <laughs> Ed's mom is gone, and Ed was said to have been inconsolable at the services for his mother's passing. He mm-hmm. was crying hysterically. That's you what know. they said about OJ, though. Well, I'm not, I want to be clear, though. I'm not trying to pick on Ed Gein, who just lost his mother. Uh, but I do want to point out something here. He didn't behave in the same manner at the loss of his father or brother. Right. Now it's just Ed. There's no father, no brother, and most importantly, no mother. Ed would remain on the farm and continue living in his parents' house. Ed still did his odd jobs for money, and he started to work for the municipal road crew. But even working with others, he still seemed to remain a solitary man. He was a good worker, though. I mean, people would say, look, if you're going to pay him a dollar to rehang your door, or fix something, you're going to get a dollar fifty uh, value out of his work. And yeah, they said not only a hard worker, but he would do a good job. He wouldn't screw anything up. You could count on Ed to do to do a good job, do honest work. And that probably came from the harshness of his mother. I mean, think If you did something wrong around the house, how she's going to ream you for that. And you're probably going to go to hell because of that. And you don't want to be a failure like your father. Yeah, you don't want to be a drunk failure like your father. And hey, you left a little peas left on your dishes. You're going to hell. So even by himself, and even once he starts working with other people, he's still not seeking friends or friendship. He still was not seeking the companionship of a woman. Ed boarded up several rooms in the family's house so that they could not be accessed. Even by himself. Yeah, but there was a lot of talk that he possibly wanted to be a woman. Yeah, right? there, w- there was like a child that he wasn't really like interested. He wasn't masculine. He wasn't he even talked several times about possibly mutilating his own um, genitalia. I think he was a very confused boy who grew up to be an extremely confused man. Well, he and what came first, the chicken or the egg, was 
was he a confused boy where his mother made him more confused or did she create all that chaos? I, I, I don't think that we will ever know. Uh, but you know, but here he is, he's alone well, in the unless house. Unless you go dig up her dead bones and ask her. <laughs> he, he's alone in their house, right? And he's boarding up these rooms. He boards up the mm-hmm. upstairs from the home and a couple of the rooms in the, on the ground level. And he started living in a small room right next to the kitchen. That, but you know, in the winter time, that is actually common in farmhouses to that, board up from room to room. Yeah, what you know, like the pocket doors mm-hmm. that I've been in uh, buddies' houses of mine. You know, farmhouses. What they do is they have their your kitchen, your family room, maybe one or two bedrooms, and they'll pocket you know all the doors up and basically cut off the heat to that part of the house. So now they're only heating about one fourth of their house. Well, he's boarded up everything and now he's only using this small room. He's using the kitchen and the shed and he's a min- you know, a minimalist and well, and everything gets, I mean, he's living very sloppily while he's living in sloppily? these sloppily. That's a word. Is that a real word? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> yes, it is. He's living very sloppily in this small space, but the, the rooms that he boarded up, they remain clean and, and kept. Maybe just like his mother would have expected. So now Ed's reading habits and interests change a little bit. He starts reading adventure stories and stories that would talk about and maybe feature things like cannibalism or Nazi atrocities. And maybe for, you know, at this point in his life, he's he's going to get another hobby. You know, so far we've only seen hobbies such as taking care of mom and reading. But with this new hobby... It's well, great. I mean, he's... He's extremely lonely at this point. I mean, he's on 270 plus acres, no electricity, no running water, all by himself. And, but he doesn't try to make friends. What he does instead is he... No, no, I understand that, but, but I'm just saying that he, this loneliness just encapsulates him. He decides to get involved in grave robbing. This is a perfect time for a beer break. Do you know what my favorite time of year is? What's that? Well, you know, I like pumpkin lattes. Hmm. You know, pumpkin pump, beer, pumpkin beer. Yeah, you know, I like to wear leggings, but I get cold sometimes. Mm-hmm. Right. So I got this thing, right? It's the best thing ever. And I'm fatty, fatty, ogre daddy, but this thing fits me well. It's a slanket. That's how you're staying warm on these cold fall evenings. Yeah. You know, some nights I'm watching a movie, got my slanket, uh-huh. right? Watching football, got my slanket. Outside drinking beer with some friends, gets a little cold, slanket. You know what I like to do when the pizza delivery man shows up at the door? I wear the slanket just to impress. Got nothing on but a slanket. That's right. He goes, what the hell is that? I go, it's a slanket. You guys all seen this before. I mean, this is a blanket and it has little sleeves, right? Mm -hmm. It has big, his big comfortable sleeves. Yeah. And the other thing too, is that they have this little pouch that hugs your toes. Okay. and And it feels good. Also, when you're wearing the slanket, and you're by the fire and somebody brings you a beer, you can say, slank you very much. That's right. We've all heard of cheap knockoffs. We've heard of wannabes, but the Slanket has grown worldwide because of the Slanket's dedication to superior quality and customer service. And they got tons of cool designs. They do, yeah, like, they I've got seen camo, that. and then like the one I got is skull and crossbones. Skull and bones. So when you're doing your true crime and chill, grab your Slanket. If you want to get a Slanket and you want to get 20% off of that Slanket, Visit theslanket.com slash garage today. That's theslanket.com slash garage. And when you pick up one of these things, take a little selfie in your slanket and send it to me. And we're back. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. We were talking about Ed Gein, and he has, he's got a new hobby. He's robbing graves. And grave robbing has been going on you since make the, it sound so positive. Since the dawn of time. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not since the dawn of time, but at least since they started burying people. Now, most people uh, are robbing graves for profit. You know, they steal jewelry off of the bodies Mm -hmm. or they pull gold from the teeth. Sometimes you have a body snatcher, you know, stealing corpses. And I don't know about these days, but like 100 years ago, you could sell a skeleton, a clean skeleton for big bucks. Ed was a body snatcher and he was taking corpses. But he wasn't really taking them for profit. He's taking these bodies back to his home or pieces of the bodies back to his home for his little experiments is what he's going to refer to this as. So we're already starting to see some signs of his psychosis. Now, 
we'll get into the body snatching later, but on November 16th, 1957, a Plainfield hardware store owner named Bernice Warden, she disappeared. Yeah, and it was the Warden hardware store. And when Warden's son told investigators that Ed Gein had been in the store the evening before her disappearance, he's saying that that Ed said, I'm going to return tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning to purchase a gallon of antifreeze. The police began to suspect Gein. Well, and there was blood at the scene too, right? There's blood at the scene. And on top of that, there is a sales slip for a gallon of antifreeze. Mm -hmm. uh, And that's the last receipt that was written by Warden on the morning that she disappeared. So investigators are going to try to go out to the Gein farm and have a chat with, with Ed, which is a spooky place. He, they get there and Ed's not there. So they, they help themselves. And when they get to Gein's property, they discovered warden's decapitated body in a shed. Yeah. So they don't actually go into the house at first. They go into the shed behind because it's unlocked. And they got their flashlights and they're roaming around and they actually bumped into the corpse. Yeah. Cause remember there's no electricity, you yeah. know, so they're walking in the dark with these flashlights. Right. And, and, I, the, and they bump into the corpse and it's hanging like on the deer hooks, you know, like if, if you ever been to a farm where they uh, do the gutting of the deer, it's like being hung by the, the little hooks. Yeah. She was hung upside down by ropes at her wrists and a crossbar at her ankles. The torso, as the captain had said, was dressed out like a deer. You know, she had been cut, you know, when they gut the animal. Mm-hmm. Um, she had been cut in that fashion. And they were able to determine that she had been shot with a twenty two caliber rifle and that the mutilations were made after her death. Gein is now in custody, and he doesn't talk much. He basically keeps quiet. And investigators keep, uh, they begin searching more through the home, and they find other atrocities on the property and in his house. Yeah. Now what they find after they arrest him obviously is a legal search, but before that it's a, that's a illegal search. It may be illegal. I don't, I don't know. I mean, they have probable cause and let's say the shed is unlocked. I don't know that if that gives them the ability to just go in there, but that's what they did. And afterwards the, the search of the house is, I mean, this search already of the shed is shocking to say the least, mm-hmm. but the, the search of the house, it gets stranger from there. And I have, I put together a little general list of items that were found. These were not all of the crazy items that were found in Ed Gein's home. Uh, some of the items I will not mention, uh, but some of the items that were found, they found human bones and fragments of bones. They found a waste basket made of human skin. Mm-hmm. human skin covering several chair seats. They found skulls on his bedpost. These were female skulls and some of them had the tops sawn off. Somebody had taken the tops of these skulls and made what appeared to be like bowls from the, from human skulls. Yeah. They found a corset made from a female torso skinned from the shoulders to the waist and this Leg- wasn't really a corset. It was just basically the front. Just the front portion. And they believed that Ed would put this on and wear it around. They found leggings made from human leg skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, several masks uh, from skin of female heads. So he he would have had to fillet the skin off of the bone, preserve the skin, and stuff the faces with paper. And then he like hung them on the walls. Bernice Warden's entire head was found in a burlap sack. They found her heart in a plastic bag in front of Gein's pot-bellied stove. Yeah, and the the telling of the detective finding this bag, so he he finds this bag and he can see hair, human hair. But for whatever reason, it was just like what he says is the natural reaction. His just uh, you know reflex you know reflex was just to grab the head out mm-hmm. of the bag. Could you, could you imagine dealing with that? No, I mean, I couldn't imagine dealing with anything that they've seen so far. Uh, but that occurs. They also find a belt made from female nipples. They find four noses and a pair of lips on a window shade drawstring. Uh, they also find a lampshade made from the skin of a human. I mean, very creepy stuff. Yeah, and they also find a uh, there's a there's another face in a paper bag, and they find a skull in a box. 
Now, it was later determined that the skull in the box and the mask found in the paper bag turned out to be that of Mary Hogan. Mary Hogan was a tavern owner and operator who had disappeared three years earlier. Yeah, and this is a tavern that uh, Ed would go into frequently, but she was known to have kind of a foul mouth. Yeah. Right? So, you know, I, I, whatever time period this would be, that would be the 54 or something like that. Yeah. She, and she was she was not a woman that took any shit from anybody. You know what I mean? She was kind of loud. She was she was the boss of her bar. She was the the tavern owner. Right, which so with his upbringing with women are evil and women are whores and women are bad, then you know, he's seeing this in life. So they believe that he probably went after her because of that. They also say that she may have looked similar to his mother at one point in her life. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, Mary probably represented everything that Ed's mom had warned him about, you know, and like you said, she was loud, foul mouthed, uh, and she was, and again, she's pushing the only legal drug, you know, she's, she's running a bar. Um, Yeah. So she goes missing. And what was interesting though, is people would talk about her going missing and Ed multiple times said, oh, no, she's she's not missing. I have her at, in my farm. Well, now they're convinced that he's probably guilty of several murders. You know, they mm-hmm. went out to figure out what had happened to Bernice Warden. They come across this other woman that's been missing, and they find all these pieces and parts uh, of these funky art projects that he's made. Yeah, and they they have no clue about the him digging up uh, graves at this point. So now they're going, okay, so we know of these two ladies, but all these other people, who are these? Did he kill all these people? So now they got to get Ed to talk. And during this questioning, Ed, he admits to the investigators that after wait, his- Wait, wait, wait. But he doesn't talk for two days. And, and this is pretty disgusting in itself, as he only talks after receiving what? A piece of apple pie- with melted cheddar cheese. I be- believe it was cheddar cheese. It's Wisconsin, right? Which is just freaking disgusting. That's how they do it in Wisconsin. It's just gross. But anyway, so he, he doesn't talk. He requests this this pie with this cheese, this disgusting animal, and he eats it, and then he just sings. Yeah, he starts telling them that after his mother died, he spent about five years body snatching uh, he claimed to have done these things in a daze, you know, like he was some under co- some kind of spell. Mm-hmm. He said that he had gone to the cemetery maybe 40 times, but many of the times he would kind of come to and he would leave the graveyard empty handed. But sometimes when he didn't come to, and on those occasions, he took the bodies or pieces of the bodies of the women back to his home in the middle of the night. He may have been in a daze. I don't know. But, but to me, he seemed like, he seemed like he knew what he was looking for. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? He was bringing home middle aged women or middle aged pieces of women who had very recently been buried. He was probably trolling the obits, but you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think some of this is manic or psychosis or, or whatever it would be because I mean, they'd let later on to go to find out that he's just not mentally stable. And it's long been questioned if he had had sex with any of the bodies or cannibalized any of them. And no one can really say for certain if he had done either. But later discussions about his acts, he claimed to have never have had sex with the bodies because they had smelled too bad. I suspect that he may not have had sex with any of the bodies, but maybe he was he was probably using them for some sort of masturbatory purposes. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and after after it's determined that he had only killed two women and that a lot of the pieces and parts were of bodies that he had taken from the graveyard, now we've got to question ourselves. You know, did Ed kill his brother? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes with the evidence of there's bruising on the head. You know, yeah. So if, you know, look, uh, how did he get the bruising on the head? You know, and maybe that the the bruising on the head was not the actual cause of death, but but by knocking him out, then he dies from the smoke. Some suspect that Ed Gein killed his brother. Uh, questioning Gein about the death of Bernice Warden in 1957, state investigator Joe 
Wilaminski brought up a question about Henry's death. And Dr. George Arden, who studied the case, wrote in retrospect, it was possible and likely that Henry's death was a Cain and Abel type situation. Then one has to wonder too, I mean, how, if, if Ed did kill his brother, Henry, Mm -hmm. any chance his mother knew about it or had any idea what had happened or. I think he would be too afraid to tell her what happened. I could see that. I definitely could see that. And the other question that we have to ask ourselves is, did Ed kill anybody else? I mean, we know that they didn't find any evidence of that at his house or in the shed. Because if you look him up, he's only responsible, as far as records go, for the the murder of the two ladies. Well, during the 1940s and the 1950s, Wisconsin police began to notice an increase in missing persons cases. There were four cases that particularly baffled police. The first was that of an eight-year-old girl named Georgia Weckler. Uh, She had disappeared coming home from school on May 1st, 1947. Hundreds of residents and police searched an area of 10 square miles of Jefferson, Wisconsin, hoping to find the young girl. Unfortunately, Georgia would never be seen or heard of again. There are, there were good suspects at the time, uh, but the only evidence that the police had to go on were tire marks found near the place where Georgia was last seen. The tire marks were that of a Ford. The case remained unsolved and wouldn't be opened again until years later when Ed Gein was convicted of murder. Another girl disappeared six years later in La Crosse, Wisconsin. This was 15-year-old Evelyn Hartley. She had been babysitting at the time that she had vanished, and her father repeatedly tried to phone the girl at the house where she was babysitting, Mm -hmm. and there was no answer. And he got worried, and the girl's father immediately drove to where she was babysitting. Nobody answered the door. When he peered through a window, he could see one of his daughter's shoes and a pair of her eyeglasses on the floor. He tried to enter the house, but all the doors and the windows were locked except for one, the back basement window. It was at that window where he discovered blood stains, and he entered the home and discovered signs of a struggle. Yeah, you'd think that if there was more DNA, you know, that not more DNA, but if they could use the um, scientific knowledge of DNA, that they could have linked some of these cases to what they found in Gein's house. Well... Well, possibly, yeah, but I, I wonder that his home was probably so cluttered with DNA that, yeah, right. that even you know had it been available, a lot back of then. Can- contamination and cross contamination and stuff like that. Well, but, a- but after the, after Evelyn's father had seen the signs of a struggle, that's when he immediately calls the police. When the police arrive at the house, they found more evidence of a struggle, including blood stains on the grass leading away from the house. They found a bloody handprint on a neighboring house footprints in the girl's other shoe were found on the basement floor. There was a regional search that was conducted, but Evelyn was nowhere to be found. A few days later, police discovered some bloodied articles of clothing that belonged to Evelyn. And they found these near a highway outside of La Crosse. Mm -hmm. Now here's some things here. We don't have any evidence pointing to Ed Gein, even though that these girls went missing during the time that he was in the area. Um, I think one would have to dive more into to him and his personality and his psychosis. Uh, I, I, the other thing too is, is he traveling that far off the farm? Is he traveling that far off the, you know, his little, little city that he lives in? Is he, is he roaming at all? Well, and before I shoot down these two, I want to point out that the the other two people that had gone missing were of men. They were out hunting, um, and little is known about their disappearance. But but looking at Gein's crimes, you see he it's it's always against women. I mean, with the exception of possibly his brother. Right. Uh, but we see a pattern here, and the other pattern that I wonder about is it seems to me like the, like the two women that they found in his home. And if he did kill his brother, these are all people that somewhat had a relationship to Ed Gein. These are people that, that he knew in some form, you yeah, know, like I said, the, the town that he lives in is so small. I mean, it's under a thousand people. I don't suspect that he was like a, okay. Like he's not like a Ted Bundy, right? Like Ted Bundy is the kind of guy where, where killing women is an addiction to him. You know, it's his, it's his, 
it's his thing. It's his bag. You know, it's his drug. He's totally addicted to it. He has to do it. With Ed mm-hmm. Gein, I don't think that he is addicted to killing. If he, if he were, we would, would have come across more victims. We well, would have found more victims in his home. And furthermore, I, I think he's more... Well, you, the, you found a bunch of body parts. Yeah, but they know where they came from. Not all of them. But the thing is here that what I think we're seeing is a difference between somebody that has to kill like a Ted Bundy right. to somebody like Ed Gein who has the ability to kill. Yeah, but they think that he has some form of schizophrenia and this normally sets in late teens, early twenties. So he's 50 years old when he's arrested. So we're talking about a 30 year window of him having struggles with mental health. But I think, I think he has some form of that to, to begin with, but I think the mental break is when his mother dies. Yeah, but it, you know, it could trigger and make it worse. But I mean, he he is found not fit to stand trial based off of a mental illness. So, just based on schizophrenia and and how it normally operates, late teens to early twenties. Well, let's talk about that confession a little bit, okay? So, Gein admits to killing Mrs. Warden. Uh, he says that he had shot her with a twenty four caliber rifle and dragged the body outside to his car and transported it back to the farmhouse. And then he would later confess to the murder of the innkeeper, Mary Hogan, that took place three years earlier. Even though for three years he was saying that she was at his farm. Yeah. So, but he said that most of the body parts had actually been taken from corpses of women. He had dug up in a local cemetery. The detectives were unsure if Gein was telling the truth on this and thought that he might be responsible for more murders so they went to the cemetery, the Plainfield Cemetery, and they exhumed the bodies of eight women, and they discovered that they had all been mutilated. Body parts, including faces, breasts, genitalia, and strips of skin had been removed by somebody who had then carefully placed the bodies back in the coffins and replaced the ground and the earth above them. Yeah, which would take a lot of work. And I, I wonder if he's doing the mutilation at the cemetery or if he's actually taking the bodies back home. I think he could be doing both. I I have no clue. Either Uh, way, it's pretty sick. You know, but he would do this in the middle of the night. Um, And and one really weird thing about his confession Mm -hmm. is he said that he and a trusted friend that he only identified as Gus had made these nocturnal raids uh, in in the wee hours of the night after, just like hours after the women's funeral. Mm -hmm. And that they had read the obituaries in the local newspaper. Now, I wonder if these women looked like his mother. Uh, well, some of them may have. They were all... Normally, they have a picture with the obituary. And they were they were middle-aged women. Mm-hmm. Uh, they probably reminded him of his mom. Uh, but, but again, we have this weird person that he talks about. Uh, so, a couple things. One, it could just be a figment of his imagination. It could be his psychosis setting in, right? For, you know, schizophrenia, seeing things. Uh, so, it's imaginary friend. Or it could actually be a real person. And then maybe their motive is not so much mutilating the bodies, but, you know, stealing what's ever in the grave. And Gein said that he didn't tell Gus what he was doing with the bodies, that he said that he was just using them for his experiments. Um, Right, which would make me, you know, they don't find all these jewelry and all this other stuff on his property. So maybe Gus's motivation is for the money. Possibly. Possibly. I mean, but what are these experiments that Gein's doing? Is he making the bride of Frankenstein back at his house? A- anyway. Well, the experiment is, you know, with furniture and, you know, arts and crafts. Gein says like the that... the sickest form of arts and crafts ever. Well, he says that he only began killing... I guess Gus would have been an older man, and Gus went to live in a, you know, retired folks' home, an old people's home, and uh, once Gus was no longer able to do these nocturnal visits with him to the cemetery, Mm -hmm. uh, that's when Gein had to start killing. Now, couldn't we dive into that more just based off of when the bodies were buried and when the murders actually took place? Possibly. I, I, I'm guessing that this is part of the reason why he was not able to go to trial. You know what I mean? That part Mm -hmm. of the reason why he was not able to go to a real prison. Um, and you know, so let's talk about that anyway. So he's arrested. He's com- he confesses after he eats his gross apple pie with the cheese, and now he has to go on trial for this. and And it's national news. This is a like I said, this is a very very small town. 
you know, under probably 700 people at this point. And now he has to go to trial. And, but now they got to figure out, is he fit to even stand trial? And they find out, well, we got to have this evaluation. So they put him into a mental facility. Yeah. Well, and another weird part of this confession was the sheriff reportedly assaulted Gein during the questioning by banging Gein's head and face into a brick wall. And as a result, that initial confession was ruled inadmissible. Now, so they got the legal search. They got beaten up Gein. But the overwhelming evidence that they find in the home and, you know. The, yeah, the, but if nowadays if people made a documentary about this, they'd go, well, he's. He's, he's innocent. You got to let him out. You got to let this monster out. The, pe- the police put the bodies in his home. Right. <laughs> uh, but so on November 21st, 1957, Ed Gein was arraigned on one count of first degree murder in uh, Wisconsin. And he entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, found mentally incompetent, and this is why he could not stand trial. Gein was sent to the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane. This is a maximum security facility. Now, later, he's transferred to the Mandota State Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is where it gets really weird for me, because in 1968, Gein's doctors determined that he was sane enough to stand trial. Now, the trial begins November 14th, 1968, and it lasts only one week. He ends up being found guilty of first-degree murder. Uh, but it, but this is where it gets funny. They send him back to the mental hospital. He doesn't go off to prison like, like one would expect. Right. Uh, he ends up back at the uh, mental facility. Yeah, but back in the day, they, they didn't have... It, there was no like crossbreeding there. I mean, you had a prison or you had a mental facility. Now, in the prisons, they have doctors and nurses on staff. One thing about this thing, too, Captain, that I've always wondered about, we're talking about, you know, Wisconsin. We're talking about Ed Gein, all mm-hmm. the crazy things that they found in his house. Mm-hmm. It's really not terribly different than what they found in Jeffrey Dahmer's home in no, his apartment. Not at all. And Gein is determined to be obviously insane, I would agree with that. I mean, the, what what little bits that that I know of that came directly, words that came directly from Ed Gein or letters that he wrote, mm-hmm. he appears to not fully understand the magnitude of his of his crimes oh, or his actions. He's a shady he's kid, man. And well, and one thing that you and I had talked about was, you know, there's a letter, a typed letter. I don't know if he wrote it because it was typed, but he certainly signed it where he's seeking legal counsel. And he says in this letter that he is excited to meet with the lawyer because he wants to discuss his release from the mental hospital. Right. Like, like, yeah, like you got a chance of getting out. Right. <laughs> I mean, come on. And we all know Jeffrey Dahmer was deemed to have been sane and he was sent off to maximum prison, maximum security prison. Yeah. But there's a good argument for him being, you know, not sane. I think there's a strong argument for both of them having been insane. However, I, I think the difference is, you know, must be the words in the confessions of the two. Mm-hmm. The, there's something in the words of those confessions that separated one from the other. And, but maybe that also comes from, because Dahmer seemed to have some remorse as far as like, you know, getting some, you know, spiritual side in his light life later. And then, you know, kind of, acting somewhat remorseful. And and you're right. He did. I mean, he said, Dahmer said, I didn't want to kill people. I didn't want to be a monster. However, that's what I was on the inside. And at some point he just accepted it and decided he was going to live. Yeah. Well, he'd, he'd battled that back and forth, but that's our episode number three. If you want to listen to us discuss Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, while Ed Gein is locked up in the mental house, um, the nut house, let's call it the nut house. And uh, this is in 1958. They decide that uh, here's a good idea. Let's auction off Ed Gein's property, right? Yeah, because it basically there nobody's paying taxes on it. There's no family members left because remember, all women are evil, so you can't have a baby with with a woman. And so the, now they just got this property and a ton of land. Yeah, and they got to sell this. Well, nowadays, you know, if a horrible crime takes place in a in a home. Uh-huh. They 
typically just bulldoze the thing over because nobody wants to be reminded of what happened there. I and, wonder if this is how they got that idea. Well, somebody had the good idea because they were going to auction off his property, they, the, the home, and all of the belongings or property that remained there. Yeah, I think there was like some probably farm equipment. There was a car. There was the house, then everything in the house that auctioned off. And this is national news, so this is bringing in a lot of people to this very small town. Yeah, because he's, I mean, he's a monster that, that makes national headlines, and everybody wants to know why and how and where. Yeah, and with all the freaky stuff that they find that, you know, people's, you know, fascination, it's true crime. That's, that's how people get fascinated with this. Well, some called it an act of God. Uh, the police probably called it an act of arson, right. but for whatever reason, the home caught fire and it burnt to the ground. Or an act of overtime, because may, maybe this was uh, done by the police. Who knows? Who knows who who did this? But it seems like somebody came, burnt down the whole house. Yeah, had it been my town, had I been like the mayor of that town, I would have been like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna auction off the the land itself, right? But the home. Let's let the firefighters have some fun with it and they can like set it ablaze and try to put it out and set it ablaze again and try to put it out. Get a little little test going on, little training. I don't know if I'd want anybody in that house. That's true. That's just, true. I mean, the amount of bad vibes in that house, would just I wouldn't want that to rub off on anybody. So the house is burnt to the ground. They sell the land, the 275 acres or yeah. close and, to that. And, and then they sell the car. Yeah, and and Gein actually has little reaction to the home being burnt down. Uh, he could almost care less, right? Uh, I think his words were, um, might, "Might as well," or "Just as well." Just as well. What he what yeah. he's claimed to have said, uh, but at, like you said, uh, the Gein car was sold. Uh, now remember, this car had been used to haul bodies of victims and possibly you know full bodies from the graveyard back to his home. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sold at public auction for seven hundred and sixty dollars. That's well over five thousand dollars in today's money. Um, and it sold to a carnival sideshow operator. His name was Bunny Gibbons. What a great name! Yeah, um, he's going to be a guest on the show next week. He would take this around to different carnivals and festivals, and it was like a one of, like a freak show almost. You know, you put a tent over it, and he would charge people a quarter to come in and see Ed Gein's. That's a lot of money back then. He probably called it like Ed Gein's death car and all kinds, you know, probably came up with all kinds of crazy names for it. July 26th, 1984, Ed Gein dies of respiratory and heart failure due to cancer. Uh, He was still living at the Mendota Mental Health Institute. Uh, His grave site in Plainfield Cemetery has been vandalized over the years and souvenir seekers they yeah, chip off pieces of this gravestone. And actually, I think the whole thing was stolen at one point. Yeah, it was a pretty big gravestone. He was buried next to his mother, which is kind of fitting. Somebody steals the gravestone. You know, when like Billy the Kid and, you know, these these famous uh, criminals and sometimes famous good people, mm-hmm. you know, people come and want to steal a piece of the, the headstone or the whole thing. I guess the whole thing was stolen, and at some point the gravestone was recovered. This would be in June of 2001, and they find it all the way in Seattle, uh-huh. uh, which is you know quite quite some distance to travel to steal a, a gravestone. Uh, anyway, it's now in. Or they're a, trying to keep Seattle weird, you know. <laughs> well, it is weird. There, it's now in a museum uh, in Wisconsin. Now we all know that Ed Gein has made an major impact in books and films. Uh, he's been, you know, sometimes when you watch like an Ed Gein documentary, they will say, Oh, this was based on Ed Gein and based on it. And then some will say it was loosely based. Now, a lot of these characters are extremely loosely based off of Ed Gein. Uh, One that we all probably know is Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. Yeah, what a scary movie. Those are are some pretty scary ones. The second one is terrible. Don't watch the second one. Just skip right over that. No, but the first one, I mean, I, I was telling you the story about how, you know, you know, you have a sleepover and then you... Everybody wanted to watch a scary movie, but it's like 1 a.m. in the morning. So we go upstairs. I'm like, we got to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre because it's based on a true story. Not knowing at the time that it was loosely based on Ed Gein and then the family and and then also just the farm itself. 
So if you see Ed Gein's farmhouse, and then you also see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre farmhouse, it's similar. And uh, so we started watching it, and it's freaky. They pick up the guy with a wheelchair, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe he's not in the wheelchair. That's the remake. Not really 100% sure on that. So The original had a guy in a wheelchair. So it's uh, it's kind of freaky, and everybody's kind of a little bored until Leatherface opens up that door, pulls the the guy or the girl in, slams the door shut, the door. and yeah. it's just quiet. It's a freaky scene. Yeah, and it scared the piss out of us. And everybody just started going, well, this uh, movie is really boring. We should watch something else. Just but so it, they, because they want to turn it off because they're cause afraid. Because we were freaked out. Well, Leatherface, he gets his name from wearing a skin mask, right. uh, you know, a, a face mask of some other person over his face. And that's yeah, why they so call him can, Leatherface. And, and that's, you can see that directly related to... Gein was e. doing something very similar. You know, he's making masks out of these out of these bodies. And like I said, the farmhouse and then the family. If the family was a bunch of Ed Gein's, what would that family be like? And you heard Buffalo Bill in the trailer, of course. You know, he was making the skin suit. One could speculate that Ed Gein was making a skin suit. You know, you talked about the, the portions of the female yeah, the anatomy corset. that he was yeah. wearing. Uh, and he he admitted some of that as well. Uh, there were also some terrible movies made. You know, you know Ed Gein, The Butcher of Plainfield. Well, well, first of all, two thumbs up on Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original. Two thumbs up on Silence of the Lambs. And so now we're going to talk about some shit. Well, Deranged was a pretty good movie uh, that took place way back in 1974. I've never um, seen that. And I'm going to give that one and a half thumbs up okay. and a big two thumbs up to Psycho, which I actually think Psycho is more like Ed yeah, Gein than think, anybody else. I don't think it works the way where you give two thumbs up. I think, you know. You're give, supposed to give a thumb yeah. and me a thumb. But you didn't see the movie, so I had to judge for oh, you. Okay. I just, I, I had to. <laughs> I had a pinch hit. Good, good thing we don't do a movie podcast. So Psycho, I think, is the one that's most like Ed Gein. This is a, this is of the uh, Norman Bates and mm-hmm. the Bates Hotel, the Bates Motel, and he has a fixation with women. Um, and he he has. I won't give the whole story away because I recommend yeah, watching. But this it. Uh, this also it's a great took Halloween place movie. Only a few years afterwards, right? Yeah, and and Norman Bates clearly has some mother issues. Uh, as yeah, I think Ed Norman Gein. Bates was probably of a higher level of intelligence than Ed Gein. So those are some movies for you to watch uh, next month. Well, with Halloween coming up, there's some several good ones in there if you've not seen them, and if you have seen them, rent them again. And then something that I thought was super odd. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. The musical, the Ed Gein musical. <laughs> Come on, that's just... I thought you were going to go back to the apple pie with cheese on it. No, that's just that's In disgusting. 2010 in Wisconsin, you could see a musical titled Ed Gein the Musical. Hey, look, if apple pie with cheese is your thing, that's cool. But send me a picture of you eating it to prove that that's your thing. Because to me, that's disgusting. And I'm a, mid, I'm a Midwest boy. Even though there's rumors that I actually do the the podcast from Hawaii, that's not true. I'm I'm a Midwest boy. He's a Midwest boy. Now I wonder if the Ed Gein musical won any Tonys. <laughs> no, no Tonys. No, no, no. It it won like a skeleton bowl. But you could Google Ed Gein art. People for whatever reason have made Ed Gein art. I think it's time to just kind of let that let it go. Let it go, people. You know, let's not sit around and try to make him into some kind of fascinating uh, piece of pop culture, you know? Well, yeah, I think what happened here was this guy did some weird stuff, and at the time, nobody heard anything about it, you know, anything of this nature. So that's how it kind of blew up. And then, And then by basing other characters on him, then you're kind of blowing up this myth even more. When it comes down to it, he had a lot of mental illness. He lost his whole family, possibly responsible for the murder of his brother. And he had a huge hatred for women and probably had a hatred for himself Mm -hmm. and being confused on, you know, it's not a masculine man. And he had a lot of issues. And because of this, people died. Yeah, and it, it, part of the thing I think with Ed Gein too is the fascination of this story has been lost on some of the generations. You know, it was such a famous story back in the fifties and sixties, 
And then, you know, we had other horrible people come along and do terrible things. And it has been kind of lost on maybe this generation. Anyways, this is a, to me, a fascinating case and kind of something that started the whole true crime thing. Definitely. Definitely. And it, it made it huge news. It, it didn't start at all. I'm just saying he's one of the major pillars on um, the nation talking about crimes. And well, and those influences into book and film. If you'd like to get more true crime and chill on, you can do so by. Yeah. Speaking of books, our recommended reading would be Psycho USA by Harold Schechter. Um, he, Harold Schechter is a true crime author and historian, and in my opinion, one of the best. And what he does in this book is he doesn't talk about, you know, the more infamous killers that, that we're all aware of, you know, the Gacy's, mm-hmm. the Dahmer, the Bundy. Uh, he's talking about more low key and lesser known serial killers in this psycho USA by Harold Schechter. And you can pick that up by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. You click on the recommended page and click on the Amazon banner. You can pick up Harold Schechter's book. You could pick up socks. You could pick up well, shoes. I picked up a new scarf and I picked, picked up a hoodie and uh, some black leggings and uh, a Starbucks uh, travel mug. I it's purchased basically my basic bitch, uh, uh, fall outfit that I like to wear who day who day no I, I picked up a uh, NFL <laughs> jersey but I will not say the team because I'm slightly embarrassed at this time right well you, you they've been embarrassing uh, the league for years for everything true crime garage go to truecrimegarage.com yeah and follow us on you know social media Facebook Twitter all that stuff at true crime garage and uh and thanks again to Slinkit for sponsoring the show today. Yeah, this is a great thing to have. I mean, you the blanket with the arms, the little things that hook your toes. And then, I mean, it's comfortable for watching football, for drinking lattes, pumpkin lattes, mm-hmm. if you do the pumpkin latte thing. Slinkit. Have you ever seen those videos online where people, they drink and they get totally slankadelic? And they it's a slank war? You know, they're like street fighting in the slankets. Well, uh, here's a, have you, have you ever played Edwards 40 hands? No. It's no. where you uh, take forties and then you duct tape your hands to the forties. Okay. Well, I did this last weekend and it's really tough to do, but I was outside. So I put my slanket on first and then I did Edwards 40 hands and I was the only one that made it through anything. Cause everybody else got real cold. But well, not my, only that, my like, slanket on. But do, are they striking you with the 40 hands? No, they just duct tape them to your hands. Oh, I thought so maybe they were fighting. We were talking about street so fighting like in your slanket. Go to the bathroom or anything. Oh wow! But it didn't matter because I didn't have to, and I was I I kept my my warmth with my slanket. And they have all kinds of different cool designs, and you can check out those designs by going to theslanket.com. And while you're there, use our promo code to get your twenty percent off. That's theslanket.com/garage. 